We are very excited to have Darren Crow here, storyteller phenomenal, and he has been traveling around Iowa and he's from coming um, from Cedar Rapids. And he is here to talk about the Underground Railroad of Iowa. Well, I, I am very grateful that I get to come and share this story in particular. Um, if, if, if you were to ask me what my favorite story is, frequently I would be telling you it's the story that I'm telling at the moment. <laughs> but this is one of my very favorite pieces to get to share with people. Um, partly because it's a true story. So you know, the people and the things that happen are real. And it's an Iowa story. And darn it. Our stories in Iowa are as important and significant as anybody else's stories. So, it starts with a newspaper ad. You know, well, we don't do it so often anymore because not so many people put things in the classifieds now. But you know, if you lost something, you might put a classified ad in the newspaper. Well, here's a classified ad from the Iowa Territorial Gazette. March 23rd, 1839, Burlington, Iowa Territory. $200 reward. Run away or were stolen from the subscriber near Salem in Henry County, Iowa Territory on Thursday night, the 11th. Two Negro men whose names are Winston and Henry, but having been run away since the 11th of August, they have called themselves Jack and Bill. They found their way into the new purchase of Iowa and the subscriber found them there and was returning them home to Missouri stopped to stay at a home from which they escaped or were stolen. Winston is 26 or 27 years of age, black, five foot eight or nine inches high, wore away a sealskin cap and blue jeans, coat with the skirts cut off and dark cassonet pantaloons. Henry is a yellow boy, 18 or 19 years old, five foot five inches or six inches high, wore a blue cotton frock coat, gingham round about, new fur hat and black skin pantaloons. I will pay the above reward to any person who may bring them to me in Boone County, Missouri, or $100 for either of them, or $100 for securing them, or giving me such information as may enable me to get them. It is supposed that the said runaways will be assisted to escape by some particular white men. Thomas Flint, March 16, 1839. Thomas has lost something. In this case, two human beings. And he had, his slaves had run away and they'd gone up into Iowa. Well, the Des Moines River is the only thing separating northern Missouri from southern Iowa at that point, And it's not very hard to sneak across the river. But he tracked them into Iowa and was bringing them home when he stopped outside of Salem. And let me tell you, if you try to stop anywhere near the town of Salem and you have slaves in your possession that you are taking home, you will leave empty handed because the citizens of Salem will not let you leave with your property. The story continues um, in a letter. The letter is from Asa Turner who lives the next town over in Denmark and he's writing to his friend James Burney in April. An anti-slavery society has been founded in our little church and we are almost to a man on the right side of the great question. Now, as to the territory generally, there is but very little light and even less action on the subject. We need some judicious and efficient men to lay before the people the nature of this abomination of abominations. The inhabitants of Salem are mostly Quakers, and many of them take a deep interest in the subject of slavery. Lately, two slaves passed through Salem and were soon overtaken by their pretended masters. As they returned with the fugitives, some of us inquired by what authority they were carrying away these men captive, and we called upon them to show their authority. The justice was sent for, and the trial was about to commence, but uh, the black boys chose to take leg bail. So the poor men stealers had to return home without their prey. A few weeks later, the slaves discovered themselves to their new friends, who undertook to help them on the way to the land of liberty. $200 was offered for the apprehension of these fugitives. Three Quakers set out with two of the runaways in a covered wagon. Four men, armed, waylaid them and demanded the slaves on pain of death. 
No resistance was made. And the poor men were taken to Missouri. One of them was immediately sold to go down the river. And for this act, the perpetrators received their $200. Three or four are professors of religion. And, and two of them are officers in the Methodist church. And the Quakers were apprehended and tried under the black law of the territory and fined $500. So the Quakers of Salem tried to get those slaves to freedom. When, under the threat of guns, the slaves were taken away from them. And I like how angry Asa is about the fact that a couple of these slave hunters were officers in the Methodist church. Part of the reason why, for more than 100 years, there were two Methodist churches in the United States. The Northern Methodist Church and the Southern Methodist Church. They didn't speak to each other for <laughs> decades after the Civil War was over. That's the people of Salem. They were anxious to help. When the Quakers moved toward Iowa from communities in Indiana, they, I think deliberately, put themselves in the corner of southeast Iowa. Their settlement at Salem was 15 miles from the border. Of course, when they arrived, there were no buildings. There was no town there yet. In fact, all there was in the center of the prairie was one gigantic cottonwood tree. You could see that cottonwood tree for miles and miles and miles. And from the cottonwood tree, you could look out on all sides and see if anybody was coming across the prairie. And so as the Quakers came into Iowa, they would go across the Des Moines River, go to the farms in northern Missouri and say, all right, if you want to get to freedom, make your way across the river and head for the lone tree. Somebody will come and take you to the next stop. There was a great big thicket of bramble bushes at the base of the lone tree. And the men from Salem had gone in and they cut a tiny path through the brambles so that you could crawl underneath the bushes and come out at the base of the tree and be perfectly hidden. Smart people. They had to be. Because, of course, Quakers believed firmly and, and deep at the bottom of their hearts that slavery was the great evil of their day. The idea that one person could own another person was one of the greatest abominations possible. And they felt it their duty to fight slavery at every turn. But being Quakers, they were also nonviolent, which meant they could not literally fight. They were not going to pick up a gun and take your slaves um, on the pain of death. So they had to be sneaky instead. <laughs> and they became marvelously sneaky in everything they did. Um, one report was that uh, a group of the men had a covered wagon full of slaves. And they were heading, they were just about to the Skunk River and were about to cross the Skunk. And they could see the slave hunters riding up behind them. One of the men jumped down from the wagon, yelled back, turn around, we've got smallpox. <laughs> Nobody wants to get close enough to find out if they actually have smallpox or not. <laughs> As they set up their town, they set up the town to help hide and move runaway slaves. Um, there were a few tunnels within the town of Salem. The entire town was not connected, but there were a few here and there. Um, jo Jacob and, and Henderson Llewellyn, two brothers, they built a nice big brick house in the center of town. It was called the Beehive. And they called it that because it was so busy with activity of slaves coming and going. And up in the attic of the Beehive was a great big wooden wheel that had ropes running down into the walls of the house. And when you turned the big wheel, one section of the main floor of the house would lift up so that you could go to the secret rooms underneath it. Um, the beehive burned down, oh, half a century ago now, probably. Uh, but the wheel was saved. And if you go to the underground, to, to the museum there in Salem, you, you, you can see the wheel. Uh, Joseph Hoag, who was a farmer on the edge of town, he had a farmhouse, like just about every farmhouse around here. You open the front door, you come in, there's the stairway going up to the second floor. Part way up, of course, there's a landing as the stairway turns. Now we all know underneath the stairs would make a great place to build a secret room, right? Yeah, what a great place to hide slaves. <laughs> 
Now, of course, it doesn't take long for slave hunters to understand that that is a great place to hide slaves. And that's the first place they're going to look. Well, Joseph Hogue knows that they know that he knows that they know. <laughs> so he built a closet under the stairs so that when the slave hunters came in, he could open the closet and say, nope, see, look, there's a closet here. No slaves under my stairs, except the closet wall only went to here. And the wall of the house was here so that you could drop down through the trap door in the landing. <laughs> Frequently, though, they didn't even try to hide what they were doing. The children of Salem were not meant to know what was going on because the work their parents were doing was illegal and dangerous. And they didn't want their children in danger, and they didn't want their children blabbing about it either. But you were all children at one time. You weren't dumb, were you? You saw things you perhaps were not supposed to see. You heard things and knew things you might not have been supposed to know. And they paid attention. And they wrote it down later. They mentioned that at one vacant lot in town, all day long, there was a fire burning. And over the fire was continually a pot of stew or a kettle of, uh, of oatmeal. And throughout the day, a wagon would come in. The slaves would get out of the wagon. They'd feed everybody, load the wagon back up, and off they would go. But to my mind, the, the cleverest of their sneaky scheme, the smartest thing they did, and the thing that I don't think ever failed, was that they simply dressed the slaves up as Quaker women. Well, in 1842, the dresses go all the way to the ground. Sleeves come all the way down. Gloves. Ladies wear big bonnets, and, and the Quaker women frequently wore long veils. By the time you have that on, no one knows if you're man, woman, black, white, pink, green, purple. And so here this wagon load of ladies would go past the slave hunters who would tip their hats and, howdy, ladies. <laughs> yeah. Peter Hobson was helping a slave one day who was, who was inside the hotel there at Salem. And, and the slave hunter was standing outside watching everybody moving around. And Peter's trying to think of how he's going to get this slave out. And there's his wife's second best dress hanging on the wall. So he bundles it up, takes it down to the hotel, knocks on the door. The hotel keeper opens the door, and Peter passes the bundle through and says, I wish thee would tell Rachel to hurry up, or we will be late for church. So a couple of minutes later, out comes Rachel. Howdy, ma'am. <laughs> and off they go. Um, this happens over and over and over again. But there are problems because they are only 15 miles from Missouri. They cross the border all the time going to farms there in the northern counties trying to help people escape. And the farmers in northern Missouri know exactly who these people are. They know their names. They know their faces. The border is so porous along there, the, Missouri, the, the Des Moines River is so easy to cross, that the northern Missouri farmers mount armed guards who march day and night up and down the river. And, and at one point, they caught Elihu Jessup when he was over on the other side in Missouri. They didn't waste any time. They grabbed him. They found a rope. They threw the rope over a tree branch, formed it into a noose, and tried to hang him. They weren't particularly good at it because they failed. <laughs> and he managed to live through it. But that was the danger. There were regularly uh, $200 or $500 bounties put out on the heads of the men from the town of Salem. They didn't particularly care if they were dead or alive. Now, it would have been somewhere around 1841 or 1842. The dates are a little bit hazy. We know that uh, about 10 o'clock at night, uh, Lindsay Coppock was working in the grist mill there in the town of Salem. He was just getting ready to close down for the day. He'd been go doing corn and wheat all throughout the day. And he's just, just starting to shut things down when one of his friends comes bursting into the mill. And he says, Lindsay, I, I don't know what's going on. There's this big group of men from Missouri. They, they've come in. They, they, they've taken a whole bunch of people prisoner. And they said they're going to take them back to Clark County and hang them. What are we going to do? 
I don't know what we're going to do. I don't even know what's going on. I mean, Lindsay had been stuck in the mill, so he had missed out on what had been going on all throughout the day. And for us to catch up to it, we have to back up a couple of days. A couple of days previous to that, uh, a group of several slaves had escaped from a farm in northern Missouri. And of course, it's never five 20-year-old men in perfect health. It's old men and little boys and, and women with babies. And on that 15-mile trek, invariably, they get spread out, which makes them easier to capture. And one by one by one on the journey across the prairie, the slave hunters had recaptured them until it was an old man and a little boy who made it into the town of Salem. Their pursuers were within sight, a couple of miles distant. The men of Salem quickly brought the old man and the little boy into the village church. And the men of the town formed a protective ring around them. And the town's little old lady, because we ought never, ever get on the wrong side of a little old lady. <laughs> She rose herself up to her entire four foot nine or whatever she was. And she said, they'll take those slaves over my dead body. I like that someone thought enough to write this down for us so that we know. Well, it's not long before the slave hunters find their way to the village church. And they say, you give us back our slaves. And the man of Salem said, no, you can't have these people. They're not slaves. Yes, they are. We've been tracking them down. We're, we're coming to take them right now. No, these, these people have always lived in Salem. We're just protecting them from you. Tempers flared. People are arguing. And, and under stress like that, even the most nonviolent of us might start to think about violence. Well, they didn't know what to do. And so they reached out to the town school teacher. Because when we don't know what to do, we either call the librarian or the school teacher. <laughs> They got Reuben Dorland. Reuben ran the school in town, and he came down to the church. And um, he began to delay, which was what Reuben did best. He said, OK, fellas, you think these people are slaves. I'm, I'm not at all convinced. I would love it if you could actually prove to me that these two people are slaves that you were hired to capture. Reuben knew the fugitive slave law well. The fugitive slave law very specifically said, you must if you are going to capture a slave, have a written description of that slave so that by reading it out, you could tell that the person you have in your possession is actually a slave. Slave hunters had left Missouri in a hurry. They thought they would recapture the slaves quickly, and they had not bothered to go through the formalities of acquiring the proper paperwork. The crowd immediately cried out, sorry, these people are free, and, and pandemonium erupts. And at this point, a guy named Paul Way is going to come into the story. And Paul will show up several times, and he always does exactly the same thing. While Reuben is busy delaying things, Paul is gathering up horses. And he puts a horse outside of every door and window in the church, so that no matter how you leave the building, there's a horse. And in the chaos, they herd that man and the little boy out. They throw them onto a horse. Paul jumps onto his horse, and he yells, well, I'm leaving. If anybody wants to follow me, they better hurry. And off rides Paul with the slaves right behind him. Now, can Paul get arrested for helping slaves escape? No. Paul didn't help any slaves escape. He just said he was leaving. And if anybody wanted to follow him, they should hurry. Paul led those slaves deep into the forest. And he helped them disappear. He got them on to Denmark who got them on to the next stop. And, and before you knew it, they were in Illinois. And those men from Missouri were mad. They left town. But then a couple of days later, they were back. They had gone back to Clark County. They went to the county seat, and they said, do you know what those people up in Iowa did to us? Not only have they stolen our property, they did not just take what belongs to us. They murdered one of your friends. What did you, what, what did you do? Did anybody die? Nobody got killed. There was not even a paper cut. And they were lying through their teeth, but it worked. It made the people of Clark County furious that the Iowans would murder somebody in defense of slaves. So they put together a gang of about 75 armed men 
they jumped on their horses and they rode back to Salem. They surrounded the town. They cut off all ways in and out. They took 18 men from Salem hostage. And they said, either you produce our slaves, or we will take you back to Clark County, have you tried for murder and hung. And that's what's going on when Lindsay's friend comes running into the mill and says, what are we going to do? Lindsay didn't know what to do. He knew they had to get help. He knew they had to find some way to free their friends. So he went around town in the dark, going up from house to house, saying, OK, look, you've got to get your gun. You've got to take your squirrel gun off the wall and fight. But most of the men in Salem were Quakers. They said, we won't. We're not going to kill somebody just to save someone else. Well, while Lindsay was running around that side of town, Elihu Jessup had also been hard at work. He was trying to figure out how to get past the guards on the roads when he saw his wife's second best dress hanging on the wall. He thought, it works when we do it with the slaves. And so he put on her dress. And it was very easy to get past the guards. <laughs> and presumably, when he was past the edge of town, he hiked up his skirts, found a horse, and headed off to Mount Pleasant to find the Henry County Sheriff. Well, here it is about midnight. Lindsay has managed to convince 10 or 12 of the men to take down their squirrel guns and pretend like they will fight. And they said, you give us back our friends. And the men from Missouri said, you are way outnumbered. We're going to do it exactly what we want. Well, just about that time, the sound of horses comes from one end of town. And in rides the sheriff from Mount Pleasant with a posse of 25 or 30 men. And the sheriff said, you get out of here, and you get out now. And the men from Missouri said, we aren't going to budge an inch. We're taking our prisoners with us. You're outnumbered. You'll never stop us. And about that moment, from the other end of town, the sound of horses came as another 50 armed men came riding in from the town of Denmark. The men from Missouri tried to keep blustering, but the Denmark men said, you don't understand. We passed word on to Burlington, and they've called out the militia. <laughs> there were 150 armed men on their way. The men from Missouri jumped on their horses and turned and rode out. These things happened continually, over and over and over again. And the citizens of Salem reacted to it all with a brilliant calm. I'm sure inside they weren't particularly calm. Uh, one night, uh, they had brought some slaves into town. And the slave hunters spent a couple of days moving around the edges of Salem, trying to figure out exactly where those slaves were hidden. Uh, Francis Sheldon was thrashing his grain at the time. And of course, without thrashing machines, you simply had to build a big rail pen, take your winnow, and toss that grain up in the air and let the wind blow the chaff away. Well, Francis and his wife worked all stinking day long at that rail pen, winnowing that wheat. It was a very long process. All day long, the slave hunters came back and forth past that pile of grain, and they kept watching Francis working with that thing. And that pile of grain never seemed to get any smaller. And it didn't because they had a couple of slaves hidden under the grain. <laughs> the children recalled that um, that particular family had small children, and they had next to nothing left for clothing. And so the little girls were excited because they had stayed up all night long sewing clothes for the children. <laughs> Joel Gerritsen was another one of the men of Salem. He was not. Uh, Quaker. He had been born in Virginia. He, he'd grown up around slavery. But he wasn't a plantation person. He was a poor white farmer. He certainly didn't have any slaves. And he didn't really know anybody that did have slaves. So it wasn't, even though he lived around it, it was not part of his life. And one afternoon, he was crossing the Blue Ridge Mountains, and he came upon a party of slaves that was being moved from one plantation to another. It was 20 men chained at their arms and their ankles. And before and behind them was the overseer on their horses with their whip and their pistol. And, and Joel stopped in the road and, and watched this parade of human misery go past him. And that was the moment that his mind said, oh, that's what the abolitionists are talking about. This is evil. I can't be part of this. He leaves Virginia and comes to Iowa. And he immediately begins working to help slaves escape. 
Uh, there is regularly a bounty on his head as he goes back and forth into Missouri to help slaves escape. And one particular night, he was away from home. Um, it was his wife, their children, and the neighbor's children in their little one-room log cabin. They just finished eating supper when there's a knock at the door. And Mrs. Gerritsen opens the door, and, and there at the door is a runaway slave. She doesn't know what to do. Her husband usually takes care of all of these things. She helps him, yes, but he's the one that does this, and she can't bring him inside. The children are there. She doesn't want to put the children in danger. There's a peach orchard behind the house. The grass in the orchard is more than head high, and, and the branches of the trees hang way down into the grass. So she tells him to go out and hide underneath one of the trees, and she'll find help. She gets her children to bed. She sends the neighbor children home. And just as she's done that, she can hear the sound of horses coming up the road. And she knows what's coming. And now she's afraid because she's alone. She sits down to wait. And she listens to the horses as they come closer. And she hears them stop there in front of the cabin. She hears the, the crunch of boots as they're walking. But nobody comes to the door. But she can see him looking in the windows. Now, it's not hard to tell that it's a one-room cabin. There's no room to hide anybody. So she hears them tromp around back in the cabin and calling to each other out in the orchards. And she waits absolutely breathless, not knowing what's going to happen. But she only hears frustration from their calls back and forth. Nobody calls out, here he is. And finally, she hears him get on their horses and ride. And when she finally starts breathing again, she runs across the street to Joseph Hogue, knocks on the door. Joseph opens the door. And she almost probably faints into his arms, saying, Joseph, help, slave, peach orchard. They go and get the slave, and they bring him to Joseph's farm. Joseph, again, has a high hill that you can see for miles around. They take the slave to the top of the hill to wait for the conductor. The poor slave, partway through the night, nearly jumps out of his skin when somebody comes up behind him. It's another farmer who has found his wife and his children. They'd gotten separated. But now they had to make it to the town of Denmark. Denmark was seven miles across the prairie. Peter Hobson was delegated to take them. Now, it was a beautiful summer night. The moon was full and bright, which meant you could see everything that moved on the prairie. You could see slave hunters, and you could see slaves. So it took them forever to make the seven miles as Peter Hobson led them along edges of trees and through deep grass. So that when they came to the forest outside of Denmark, the sun was already coming up. He couldn't take them into town to the conductor because they would be seen. So he hid the family in a ravine and said, wait here. When the sun sets tonight, the conductor from Denmark will come and get you and take you on to the next stop. And then he had to make it the seven miles back across the prairie without being captured, which wasn't too hard because he was the best rider in Henry County. He was well known for being able to ride fast, shoot straight. He raced across the prairie in record time jumped off his horse at the barn, brought it inside, handed the reins to his father. They put the feed bag on the horse. They began to rub the horse down, got it cleaned, got it fed, put it in its stall, hid behind a box just as the doors of the barn opened. And the slave hunters came in. The slave hunters had been doing this long enough that they understood quite clearly that if you have been out running slaves, your horse is going to be winded and sweaty. So they walked through the barn looking at every horse. And of course, Peter's horse had been brushed, cleaned, and fed, so it didn't look like it had been out at all. The slave hunters were mad. Two of them headed back to Missouri. A couple of them stayed in town. They spent a couple of days hunting all throughout the town of Salem. Of course, the slaves were long gone. That didn't mean there weren't other slaves hidden in Salem. Um, one of the children remembered and wrote down later, 
Well, father worked with the slave hunters, and he helped them hunt very carefully and very thoroughly everywhere that he knew there were no slaves hidden. <laughs> and I just, I love that picture. I think they're over here. I could have sworn that's where we put them. Huh. At one point, they knock on a door, and um, the little old lady opens the door. Bless that little old lady. He said, do you know where those slaves are? And again, she draws herself up to her full four foot nine, and she says, yes, I do. And if you weren't a pack of fools, you'd have found them by now. Slam. <laughs> the people of Salem remembered that um, the slave hunters happily forced their way into houses to search. But there was one place in your house that they wouldn't go, and that's the cellar. If there was a slave hidden in the cellar, they didn't care. They weren't going down there to look, because of course your cellar was dirt, and your cellar was dark, and your cellar was isolated from everybody else. And if they went in the cellar, there was a good chance that you could whack them over the head, bury them in the cellar, and no one would ever know. So they chose to risk it, rather than actually go down in the cellars. But after two or three days, the other two slave hunters came back. And this time, they brought with them a 100 armed men and a cannon. And they said, you give us those slaves, or we will turn the cannon on the town and level it. We haven't got them. They're long gone. And so there was no success. <laughs> Probably the best documented of these stories, um, mainly because lawsuits over this particular uh, escape stayed in court for more than 20 years. It was sued and countersued and appealed and appealed. And so it's incredibly well documented. Um, in 1843, Rural Dags was farming there in northern Missouri. And, and by all accounts, Rural Dags was no Simon Legree. He was not a cruel man. He was not abusive or hard on his slaves. But he was a slave owner. He owned 25 slaves. And it was, it was hard work in northern Missouri owning slaves because you always had to be keeping an eye on them or they would disappear across the Des Moines River into Iowa. And so finally, Rule said, you know what? It's, it's just not worth it. I'm going to sell them off. And when his slaves heard that they were going to be sold, they immediately panicked because they knew if they went further down the Mississippi River, which is where they were going to go, Demand for workers in the cotton fields of the Deep South was escalating every month. And the price of slaves was rising every month. And Rule Dags knew if he sold his slaves further down toward Mississippi and Louisiana, he could make a good profit on them. But the slaves knew what was going on in Mississippi and Louisiana. They knew they would die. And so nine of them decided to run. And that's exactly what they did. Um, it was two men three women, and five, four children. And they took off one night. The first place they went was probably one of the smartest things they could have done. They didn't cross the river immediately. They went a little ways over to the farm of a guy named Dick Leggins. And it was very smart of them to go to Dick's house because he was nuts. Absolutely and completely bonkers. And so nobody ever came to see him. He was left to himself. And the slaves spent a few days there with leggings, um, resting, eating good food, gathering some strength. And just as they were ready to cross the river, it started to rain. And it poured buckets. And in no time at all, the Des Moines River went from able to walk across to flood stage. So they were delayed further by needing to build a raft. But they got their raft built, they made it across the river, and they were heading for Salem. Now, it didn't take Dags very long to realize that he had lost nine of his slaves. And when he did, <laughs> rather than heading off himself, he asked his son to take care of finding his slaves. OK, how many times when we ask our children to do something around the house, <laughs> do they not quite get the job done? Dags' son subcontracted. He hired a couple of men 
go after his slaves. He hired Samuel Slaughter and James McClure, which I gotta say are the perfect villain names, aren't they? Slaughter and McClure, slave hunters. My family's all from Southeast Iowa, Northern Missouri, and there are McClures there in my family tree. So I'm kind of operating under the assumption that James McClure is a distant relative of mine. I know over the next couple of days, they get rounded up and they head for Iowa. I know they spend the night at the home of a man named Mr. Way. It's probably Paul Way. And Paul Way's not gonna have slave hunters sleeping in his house and not send word on to Salem that trouble is coming. They get up the next morning and they're riding and as they crest a hill, they can see out ahead of them a covered wagon moving at far greater speed than covered wagons ordinarily do heading toward the forest at the edge of Salem. Slaughter and McClure whip up their horses because they know if that wagon makes it into the forest ahead of them, they're gonna lose the slaves that are in the back of that wagon. They race across the prairie, but as fast as their horses are going, they still, the wagon gets into the forest about 10 minutes ahead of them. And when they catch up to the wagon, it is driven by two nice Quaker men who are its only occupants. The two nice Quaker men have been out fishing all morning. Not that there are any fish in the wagon. They haven't been biting. <laughs> Slaughter and McClure head into Salem. They spend the night in Salem. And they head out the next day into the forest around Salem. And they round up their slaves. And they're getting ready to head back to Missouri. And the men of Salem say, whoa, whoa, did you, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. These people aren't slaves. Slaughter and McClure said, yes, they are. They're our slaves. They're the ones we've been hired to catch. No, no, these folks have always lived in Salem. They're, they're Salem residents. Been here for years. Tempers are starting to fray. The people of Salem say, you can't leave without a trial. There has to be a trial. Um, we're we're going to put it before the judge. And so they get the justice of the peace. They, they want to have the trial in Henderson Llewellyn's house. But everybody in Salem wants to see what's happening. So they're all trying to squeeze into the front parlor. And there very quickly is no room. So they adjourn, and they move the venue to the village church. And the village church immediately fills up with everybody in Salem. Well, everybody except Paul Way, who's busy rounding up horses. Reuben Dorland is summoned as the attorney for the defense. And he begins a long opening statement and says something along the lines of, you think these people are slaves? Oh, boy. Uh, no, no, they've always lived here. Um, I'm not even sure that slavery is legal. Can you, can you prove to me that slavery is legal in Missouri? Slaughter and McClure weren't the brightest bulbs on the Christmas tree. Uh, uh. See, we know these people really well. They've always lived here. Can you prove that these are the people that you were hired to, to find? Uh, and finally, Dorlin pulls out his trump card. Please produce for me the written descriptions of all nine of these people. Well, Dags' son had not done a good job. He was in a rush to get this subcontracted out. He just told Slaughter McClure to go get him. He didn't give him any of the paperwork. They had nothing. The judge bangs his gavel and calls out, these people are free. And in the pandemonium that erupts, they are spirited out onto horses. Rumps are slapped. Horses begin running. Paul Way yells at the top of his lungs, oh no, somebody stop those slaves. Don't let those slaves follow me. <laughs> Off they go. Chaos erupts. Slave hunters, Slaughter McClure, searching all over town. They send word back to Missouri. 150 armed men show up. They want these slaves, and they want them badly. They put out a, a $250 bounty on Elihu Jessup and Joel Garrison. Elihu is hidden under a pile of potatoes in somebody's cellar. Garrison rides off to the lone tree where he can see if anybody's going to be after him. In the end, a few of the slaves are recaptured. One of them is Julia Fulcher. Julia was 16 in 1843 when she was recaptured. 
and she remained a slave until 1865, at the end of the war. At the end of the war, she married Hezekiah Hall. He was another freed slave. They settled down to farm. They should not have succeeded. I mean, everything was set up against them. They couldn't read, they couldn't write. Uh, the sharecropping rules were, were designed to make sure they would stay defeated. But they worked hard. They scrimped, they saved, and they bought their little farm. Um, their son, Sam, when he was little, he wanted to go to school. His parents wanted him to learn to read and write. But he couldn't go to school in Missouri. He was black. So every day, Sam went across the Des Moines River into Iowa, where he could go to school. Because Iowa's schools had been integrated since the 1860s when Alexander Clark did it. As Sam grew up, he eventually took over the farm from his parents. He started helping his neighbors. When his white neighbors needed help with fences, he helped them. When the county needed somebody to help with a board or with a road crew, Sam helped. He had a boy named Ira. Ira, when it was time for him to start going to school, he could finally go to school in Missouri. He learns to read, to write. Um, as Ira grows up and takes over the farm from his father, Ira teaches Sunday school to the children of the folks who had enslaved his grandparents. He is on the county road board. He helps with 4-H clubs. He does everything he can. So that in, in 1976, when the bicentennial is happening and Clark County decides to have an old settlers parade, it's Ira Hall that they ask to lead the parade which I think is beautiful because of hard work and love. The, the grandson of people who had been enslaved by their neighbors is the one that they turn to and say, you're the most important person in our county. I just think that's awesome that we move from this scared 16-year-old scared girl in 1843 to leading the parade. Now, there's one last, one last little bit to these stories. And I think it's kind of one of the most beautiful parts. Um, and that is the Pickards. Now, Henry Pickard had come up from North Carolina. His wife, Eleanor, and he had <clears throat> 18 children together. I know. <laughs> 16 of them lived into adulthood. Strangely enough, not long after they moved up to Iowa in 1845, Mrs. Pickard died. I can't imagine why. Um, he marries uh, a widow whose name is Mary. And strangely enough, she had also had 15 children. There were still several of hers at home, still several of his at home. So once again, they were back to a household of like 15 or 16 kids. Henry was a big man, six foot something, 300 pounds, all of it muscle. Now one night, they just finished up supper, and there is a knock at the door. And they open it up, and there's a runaway slave. And the man has a very, very small baby girl in his arms, and he says, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with her. She's sick. I can't take her with me. Will you, will you take her? Henry says, well, <laughs> at this number, what's one more? <laughs> the man said, I'll come back for her. But they never saw him again. They don't know what happened. They don't know if he, if he was able to make it to Canada, or if he died along the way, or if he was returned to slavery. Um, but they brought the girl in. They named her Mary. And she just became child number 16. She did everything with her brothers and sisters. When it came time for her to go to school, well, if anybody was going to complain about this little black girl going to school with all the white kids, they weren't going to complain to Henry. Because <laughs> he wasn't going to have any of it. And, and when Mary was 18 years old, um, she thanked her parents. She hugged and kissed her brothers and sisters. And she said, it's time for me to go out into the world. And she headed out into the world. And, and that was the last that any of the Pickards saw of her until 
to make sure I get the date right here. Until July of 1935, when there was a Pickard family reunion and a 78-year-old woman showed up at the picnic. It was Mary. She'd gone to Des Moines. She'd met a nice man, married, had children and grandchildren, and never forgotten the kindness of this family. Now, most Underground Railroad stories happen over a, a day or two, maybe a few at the most. But this one was an 18-year story. And I just think that's beautiful and wonderful. Um, occasionally, families would try to bring slaves into Iowa. Um, it so happened that um, a, a family, the Berries, they came into Henry County and they had the temerity to bring a slave with them. They had said it was, it was their children's mammy and that uh, they were very attached to her and the people said, he, you, you can't have a slave, this is Iowa. And they said, all right, we'll take her back to Kentucky and, and give her her freedom or sell her or something. Well, they came back, and it turned out as word drifted back up, they had not actually taken her back to Kentucky and reunited her with her family. They traded her in Missouri for the contents of a store that had gone bankrupt. Mm -hmm. The Iowans were not having this. No. Um, one of the old men of the town, uh, a brother of Nathan Kellum, he was dying. And maybe old dying men have a certain sense of prophecy. He stopped the Berry brothers on the road one day as he was on his last legs and he said, nothing you do will prosper. Your fields shall bring forth rocks and thorns. And he dies. And the fields of the berries from that day forward brought forth nothing but rocks and thorns until they sold up and went back to Missouri. And from the moment they sold their farm, it brought forth crops in abundance and bounty. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is just kind of cool. All of that to say, these stories are important because the people of Salem saw something wrong. They saw before them what they considered to be the great evil of their era. And they did not say someone should do something. They said, I had better do something. And they did it. And I'd like to think that that is our heritage as Iowans. Continually throughout our history, we were faced with moments where one might say someone should do something. And Iowans, as a general rule, did not wait around for that. They simply did it. In the Civil War, we sent more soldiers to fight in the Civil War than any other state per capita. Um, when Alexander Clark felt that it was not right that his daughter should not be able to go to the same school as all the other children in the state, he fought and got the schools of Iowa integrated, you know, a hundred and some odd years before the rest of the country. Um, you all, who most of you, not all of you, are a few years older than I am probably, had your opportunities to stand up and do things, and you did. And I'd like to hope that um, my generation will do as well as you all have. <laughs> I hope. And that's why I tell these stories to especially to children, because I think they're that important. Um, and of course, your stories are also vitally important. You all have them, and your story is important, even if you don't think it is. Um, make sure you tell it. If, you get to, if you're older and you get to spend time with small people, tell them about the stupid things that you did. <laughs> no, it gives them ideas. <laughs> <laughs> or tell them about the stupid things their parents did. That gives them ammunition. <laughs> some of those might show up at the library someday. You never know. <laughs> but that's my story. So thank you very much for letting me share it with you. All right. Thank you, Darren. And thank you, everyone who came out tonight. Thank you, SMU, for taping this and letting it go out to more people who couldn't show up tonight. And I hope you guys drive safely. I don't know if it's still uh, a little slick out there, so mm -hmm. no? Not All right, really. well, cool. then bundle up. Okay, it's cold. <laughs> okay, have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.